Okay, welcome everyone to our training here. Let's give a second for everybody, for people to come in. Right, Laura, we can see as the... Yeah, we can see people joining. Yeah, you're welcome to tell us in the chat um, who you are and where you're from. We just put in the chat that we encourage you to tell us who you are and, and where you're joining from. Our session is being recorded uh, today. We'll just wait a couple more minutes. Hi, Florence. Hi, Gabriella. Yes, we'll wait until 2.35 to start. Or maybe do you want to put the other screen up so people know what the title of this session oh, is? Oh, sorry, I think I accidentally. Yeah, it's really it when I was <laughs> sensitive. I know it's so sensitive. So as you're joining us, if you haven't um, told us where you're joining us from, please do so. We'd appreciate that. Laura and I are here from Global Rights for Women, which is located in um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. We also like to connect with people on uh, social media and email and such and you can find our information in the PowerPoint. We did upload the PowerPoint uh, file as well. Also, we welcome your comments and questions um, during the presentation in the chat. So feel free to put those in there as well. I'm gonna start in just a couple more minutes, but if you're just joining us, if you could uh, write in the chat where you're from and where you're joining us from, that would be great. Just one more minute and then we'll get started. Uh, one thing to know is that we are going to show show a short video at one point so so you know that the if the video itself doesn't come through a lot the audio should and the audios 
Um, we have some screenshots of, of what's in the video as well, so you don't need to worry about that. I have to put on my computer glasses. Okay, so should we go ahead and get started? Yeah. Yes, our so. host, if that's okay. Sure. It is being recorded so people can watch it also after. So, okay. So um, we're just gonna introduce ourselves. I'm Melissa petrangelo Skaya. I'm the Director of International Training at Global Rights for Women. Uh, previous to working at Global Rights for Women, I was the Director of Domestic Abuse Intervention Programs, which is known as the, the Duluth model. For those of you who have seen the Power and Control Wheel before um, and heard of the Duluth model and Coordinated Community Response, which our session is about today, um, all three of those were um, began in Duluth, Minnesota. So I was the Director um, there before that, before here. And then previously, um, I worked at a domestic violence shelter and um, supervised visitation center and advocacy program. So I um, ran that ad advocacy program for 17 years in that shelter program. Um, I still co-facilitate men's dom domestic violence offender groups um, to work with domestic violence offenders. Um, so I still do two sessions of those a week. Um, we're actually having a uh, one of these sessions tomorrow. I'm not gonna be there, but uh, two of my colleagues will. Um, I'm gonna be gone tomorrow, but they're gonna do a session on working with um, doing a batter's intervention program or a domestic violence offender program uh, using Zoom or using video conference software. So they'll be doing that um, tomorrow. And then I also testify as an expert witness um, on domestic violence and have my master's thesis on the effects of domestic violence on children. So Laura? Hi, I'm Laura Wilson. I'm an attorney with Global Rights for Women. And uh, prior to joining our organization, I was an attorney with Legal Aid and uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota and represented mostly immigrant women and children um, as well as unaccompanied children who were living on their own, um, primarily due to abuse. So I worked on a lot of immigration related cases, family law, child protection related cases um, involving gender based violence. And um, now at Global Rights for Women, I'll, I'll just tell, give a little background around about the organization itself. We're an NGO that's based in Minneapolis. And we work with partner organizations around the world to improve legal system and um, criminal justice system, primarily response to violence against women and girls. Um, we do a lot of training, capacity building, um, helping communities to develop coordinated community responses, which we'll be talking about today, um, as well as analyzing laws and giving input on legal reform. And so we're really excited to be here at CSW and I think I saw a couple of you in our session last night on listening to survivors. Um, so this is going to be a very complimentary session to that one, but with a lot of different materials. So I hope you'll get something different out of today's session than you did last night. Um, yeah, so can, um, if you've just joined us, please feel free to put your name and where you're joining from in the chat. I saw a couple more people come on as we were doing introductions. And then feel free to continue, um, you know, interacting with us in the chat, putting any questions you have as we go forward. So to kind of ground our conversation today, um, coordinated community response is um, a method of social change. And so we wanted to talk about some core principles of that. We know that social problems are always changing. And if we don't know that this year during the pandemic, we you know, we'll never know it. Um, we always need to continue to adapt and we'll always identify new problems that we need to figure out how to solve as social conditions change. Um, we approach violence against women and girls as a social problem rather than as a problem with an individual. Um, we know that violence against women and girls is rooted in patriarchy and that although there are different ways that that um, appears or plays out in different communities around the world, there are also a lot of similarities. Um, and there are, you know, there are also intersections with other forms of oppression. So we, um, we find that taking a, a social change approach is more effective to getting at the root causes of violence against women and girls. Um, another core principle is to ensure those who are subject to oppression are included in making changes. So this for us means engaging women who are survivors of violence in the process of um, you know, figuring out what changes need to be made, 
we know that women are the experts on their own lived experiences. Okay, so this slide here um, just is a bit of a, a graphic that shows you, as I mentioned, I'm the previous um, director of the Duluth model in Duluth, Minnesota. And so the Duluth model is really an approach in which you can create interventions. Um, what we have here for you um, is a diagram of what's known as the criminal justice coordinated community response. Often when people think about coordinated community response or CCRs, they think about criminal justice, but um, they can also be done um, in many other different ways. They can be done, for example, with child protective services. Um, our partners at the Better Women's Justice Project do that with uh, family law and they're organize a, organizing a coordinated community response under with the family law system. You can also do this in communities. So for example, when I worked in Duluth, there was also known uh, what was known as the Christian coordinated community response where Christian churches had really organized to say how will we coordinate a response around domestic violence um, in northern Minnesota there were a number of um, women who had a Christian faith who did not want to call the police that they were they found themselves and the pastors found this happening too that they were calling their pastors so we worked with those pastors to create a coordinated community response that kept for sort of the, the principles of safety and justice. So we just sort of show you this graphic here just as more of a, to see all the, the partners in, in how we think of this. And the next slide, this is the, the most common definition of coordinated community response that was developed in Duluth, which is an interagency effort to change the climate of tolerance of battering by institutionalizing practices and procedures which centralize victim safety and offender accountability in domestic violence case, domestic assault cases. Now, this is the original definition. So um, this is now also used in cases of sexual assault. It's used in cases of you know, trafficking, all forms of violence against women. But we wanted to share with you the sort of original definition that came out um, of the Duluth program. And just um, for a term of reference in terms of battering another way, you know, it's a form of domestic violence, the most common form often called coercive controlling uh, violence and abuse. So um, what we're going to do next, it's the next, it's the next one is right? Yeah, Laura. Okay, so this is a graphic here that you're going to see. And I'm going to um, take out my headphones here just for a second. And I'm going to pull up a video um, for you so that you can see this video. Hold on one second. Um, Laura, do you want to mention just as I'm getting this up what they're going to see? Sure. So this is going to be a video. You probably just got a brief glimpse of that slide, but it showed multiple different systems that a woman and her children are having to navigate um, as they are dealing with domestic violence. And so this video is going to um, focus on one woman's experience of trying to navigate the system in multiple systems. I'm not hearing the audio. I think you need to unmute, Melissa. Sorry, sorry about that. I was getting it ready. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, your turn, Portia. Come on, guys. Mom, can we play till I win? Audrey. It's been so crazy around here. Girl, what did he do now? Girl, I did it. I called the police on his ass and they took him out of here. Oh my goodness. Mom, I got into the band. Miss Peter said I'm good enough to play the violin. Mommy is so proud of you. I just want you to know that I knew you could do it. Hey, what do you think we should do for mom's birthday? How about a surprise party? That'd be a great one. Mom. When is dad coming back? I hope he's here for Christmas. Daryl, are you ready to go? Baby, you know I didn't mean to do that. You know how much you and the kids mean to me. What can I do to make No, 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 no. Calvin, uh-uh. I've heard it too many times before. Mom, those people are at the door again. Oh, all right. Just, just tell them I'll be down there. Just go downstairs and wait. I'm on my way. What did you do? Why do these people tell me I can't see my kids? Oh, you're gonna pay for this. Rachel, you listening to me? 
Mom, can I have a friend over tomorrow? Portia, I don't know, okay? But Mom... I'm very busy. Dara got to have a friend over last week. Ms. Williams, I'm calling to inform you that you're past due on your phone bill. Would you be able to make a payment by the 30th? I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Hush. Listen, those kids don't know anything about you. You are a wonderful child. You are a beautiful girl. Hey, Mom, Pastor Freud called. He wants to know if we can sing at church. I told him we will. But Daryl, oh. Mom, don't forget our basketball practice after school. I won't forget, Portia. I, I would never forget. When is it? Mom, I don't feel good. You don't feel good like what? Don't hang up. Just let me tell you, hey, the last time I talked to you, I was just really upset. Just, you know, let's just work this thing out. Calvin, no. It doesn't work like that, okay? Audrey, I do not know what I'm going to do. Girl, they are evicting me. I mean, I won't have a place to live. Girl, what am I supposed to tell my kids? I know y'all miss me, right? Is mom taking good care of y'all? Now, you know I'm gonna be home as soon as I can, but it's up to your mom. Dad coming home? I don't think Dad will be coming back home, honey. He wants to come home, but he says he won't let him. Oh, baby. Mom, I aced my spelling test. Can we go shopping? Mom, can you tell Dare to get out of my space? She started it. Did not. Did too. Stop it. Okay, so um, we have just a few questions for reflection that we'd like to put up on the screen here and we'd like you to um, put your thoughts in the chat or, um, you know, uh, we do have because the ability to allow you to talk so if somebody would like to say something if you want to raise your hand we're willing to do that as well but um, if you're more comfortable putting it in the chat you're more than welcome to do that as well but we want to just kind of know what it stood out to you about Rachel's story. Uh, what impact did her experience in these systems have on her? Which system would you tackle first and why? And what would be the first step that you would take to address this problem? Meaning, if you think about which one of those systems you'd address in terms of a coordinated community response, what would be the first step you would take in terms of working to change that system? So you can choose to end any of those. Um, yeah, so systems to tackle first. Yeah, better accountability. Yeah, so Gabriella, would you mind saying a little bit about like which system? So when I say, so, oh yeah, okay, so like housing, right? So there are many systems shown there. There was the housing system. There was the child protection. There was the civil court. There was criminal court. There was many, many different systems that were there. Yeah. Other thoughts about what stood out to you about Rachel's experience or what? Um, how this impacted her? Did anyone, anybody be willing to say something? Laura, do you want to share some thoughts? Sure. I mean, I think what always, um, what always stands out to me in this video is just the kind of many, many layers of what Rachel has to deal with once she's made the decision to call 911. So once she makes that call, um, which is really for help, you know, it's, it's an emergency. She sounds like she's fed up. She finally has decided to reach out for help. And then, you know, what follows that is her having to work really, really hard for her safety, navigating all these different systems while still, you know, being a good mom, being a good church member, being a good parent. Um, it reminds me of um, a, a survivor who I talked to um, recently who said that 
she felt like dealing with the system was almost harder than dealing with the abuse because it was just so much and so much that was unexpected that, you know, came at her <laughs> so quickly, you know. Right. And with the system, you know, even though abusers are unpredictable, so are the systems, right, in the understanding of what they want and what they expect. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Well, what we're going to go through with you about is kind of what's known as coordinated community response and how it is that if you were going to sort of tackle any of these systems, this is what's known as the CCR problem solving um, sort of methodology. Each of these is a particular step. So let's just say that we decided to take on one of those systems. So we've identified a problem with a victim. We've decided as a, as a community that we're gonna document the problem and we're gonna look at it. But what we find too often, so I know we don't have these, these sort of boxes numbered, but often what we find is that most communities skip um, box number two, three, four, and five and go right to drafting a proposal for change. So what, what we'll find is somebody will come to a CCR meeting or a, a, like a family violence council meeting or whatever you want to call those meetings um, that I've been going to for 21 years. And um, I, this is just kind of a little joke that I have some time. You know, I work with um, men who commit domestic violence in a group process. And sometimes I find those group meetings to be easier than CCR meetings um, because a lot of practitioners, you know, don't want to make changes um, and they don't want to, um, you know, sort of um, change the way in which they do things. So what we would say to you is that the, the true process of coordinated community response requires us to spend a lot of time understanding what is the problem um, is part of it, but also what's creating the problem, right? How does that problem get created and identifying the sources of it? And too often what we don't find in communities, what they don't do is that they don't take time to go and do a focus group with victims or do interviews with victims. That somebody will come to the meeting, identify the problem and somebody will say, oh, hey, I heard in this other community in this other country that they're doing this to address that problem. Let's do that. And then they try the intervention, right? Or they have an idea of their own that maybe they didn't hear about it from another community. And they say, well, I think we should try this to address that. And what we're saying is that overwhelmingly that those that doing just that is not gonna be as successful as taking, to un taking the time to understand how the problem was created and for sure taking the time to interview victims or doing a focus group with them. So that's a little bit what we're gonna talk with you about is some real practical steps to take when trying to address this. So um, the, the, core, the core process that we use is called the eight methods. So you can see um, in um, this graphic here, you have kind of a, a cartoon drawings of practitioners kind of sitting in the middle um, of that. And what you see around them is kind of puzzle pieces, which is a way to solve coordinated community response problems. And so often what's been done, I mean, if we just think about for a minute, how much money has been spent on training, right? On training police, on training prosecutors, on training social workers, right? All those different things. So much money has been spent on that. And the, the issue is we have not seen a lot of change for how much money has been put in. So what happened is in Duluth, Minnesota, they developed what they, when they developed the coordinated community response and started to do training, they saw that that had some effect, but not enough of an effect. So the eight methods was developed and this is what created real change. So we're gonna go through these with you, but what I want you to think about um, essentially, and we're just gonna use the police as an example. Let's say that we have um, two police officers. Um, we have first name Marcus and first name Roy. So we're gonna use those two police officers as examples. Now, Marcus is the police officer that really you want on every single call for a violence against women call, whether it's domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, you want Marcus. He's, he's gone to a lot of trainings. He talks about the issue in the way that you want him to. He writes really good reports, okay? Now, then you also have Roy. Now, Roy is a police officer. He's been to the same number of trainings as Marcus has, right? Um, but Roy does not do very good work, 
okay? Whereas reports um, are very minimal. Um, he, he doesn't take a lot of care um, in his work for you know, domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, trafficking, any of those cases. So what this methodology says is that we wanna get away from thinking about trying to train all of the Roy's to be a better police officer. What this method says is let's not just focus on training, but what we want to do is we want to think about, okay, so Laura and I are each here, you can see the two of us, okay, so if you think about the chairs that we're sitting in, imagine that Laura and I both work in a police department, okay, and we work with Marcus and Roy, okay, they're our co-workers. Well, the idea is that with Marcus's desk, my desk, Laura's desk, and Roy's desk, we want to think about how is that job organized, right? So that no matter who ends up sitting in those chairs now or in the future, how is that job organized in a way that it's organized in a way to best address violence against women cases? So what this approach does is really gets you away from just thinking about who's in the chair. And, and we will address who's in the chair. But first, we want to think about no matter who's in the chair, who, how are we going to organize this police officer's job to best address violence against women. So that's how we're gonna talk about those eight methods. We're gonna think about if all four of us, Marcus, Roy, Laura and I were, all worked in the police uh, agency and how we organize the job. And we're gonna use that as the example that we talk through about these eight different methods. So the first one is mission, purpose, and function. So mission, uh, purpose, and function really looks at sort of the overall you know, what is the role really um, of this job when it comes to violence against women cases, right? How do they think about it? What's their purpose? What's their function? And the reason why this one is really important is often we'll find that a lot of advocates or a lot of people from the outside want a practitioner to do something that really isn't even in their purpose, right? That it's really outside of their scope. So what this process does, and it helps us understand and think about what is the mission, purpose, and function, and just to use the police as an example, to centralize victim safety. So what we have for you on the next slide is we have an example of the Duluth, um, Minnesota Police Domestic Violence Policy that they've actually put it in writing. They've said, we're gonna think about this together with our coordinated community response and put how we see our mission, purpose, and function and put it in our policy. So this is right at the beginning of their policy. And I know you can read this for yourself, but just, you know, just to highlight a few parts of this, and that is that this department is committed to engaging in a comprehensive approach to intervening in domestic abuse cases. Now, this is the one that's specific to domestic violence. They also have one for sexual assault. They also have one for um, human trafficking. So they have one for each. We just pulled the domestic violence one. And that really that the investigation of these cases sets down the foundation for almost every subsequent action by the courts and community agencies. So what I think what's really important about this sentence, it reminds the police like what you do really is really setting out what's going to happen for the case along all the other different parts of the criminal justice system. So concepts and theories. So concepts and theories is the next one. So concepts and theories is really kind of what's the thinking, right, about how we approach these cases. So just to use domestic violence um, as an example, this is where we would get to a little bit of, of changing the minds of the people who are, in, who are in the job, right? So when you think about concepts and theories, this is where you're gonna train, you know, Marcus, Roy, Melissa, and Laura about how to think about domestic violence and the, in these cases, okay? The one big thing though about concepts and theories that a lot of people don't think about is that every piece of paper that we have in our jobs that we fill out in terms of our forms, there's some sort of concept and theory about how to think about um, this issue of violence against women. Our policies have concepts and theories embedded into them. Our protocols do and our practices do, right? So for example, you know, it's a pretty common practice of the police that when they go to a domestic violence incident, what they do is they separate the parties, right? That one, that um, assuming you can have more than one police officer show up at a scene, that one police officer talks, say it's a heterosexual couple, talks to the man over here and the woman over here, outside of sight and sound of the other. And the reason why we do that is because we know that intimidation is a big part of what abusers do to victims. 
right? Because that's the concept that we use is to understand that. Now, if we had embedded a different sort of concept in theory, like to think that, well, you know, domestic violence is really a problem of, of, of two people who can't get along and they need to better learn how to talk to each other. If you embedded that theory, which we think is a problematic theory, but if you did into that police practice, what you would probably get is police to get the couple to sit down and figure out how to work out how to get along better, all right? Or maybe they might bring somebody else to help them think that through, right? So the important thing about concepts and theories is that you're gonna see this embedded in every single practice that an agency does and their forms, not just in their training about how to think of the problem. The next of the eight methods that we're gonna talk about is resources. So these are all of the things that workers need to do their jobs, as well as the way that the agency or department prioritizes cases. So where do they put the resources? For example, in a police agency or a court, are res more resources put towards cases involving drugs or traffic or theft than they are towards violence against women and girls? Are more resources put towards other types of violence than towards violence against women and girls? Um, resources can also um, relate to what victims need for safety. So, um, you know, when you think back to the graphic of all the different systems that victims are involved with, um, they need they may need they need an effective criminal justice response, but there are many other resources that victims also need. Um, and then, what interveners need to hold men accountable. So, resources can be you know what uh, funding or what personnel are we putting towards um, accountability after um, a domestic violence incident occurs or someone's arrested. Um, to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, this can also be caseload. How many cases are assigned to one person? Can they handle that number of cases? Um, how many police are assigned to domestic violence cases? Um, so it, it's a pretty uh, a broad area and I think an issue for uh, all over the world um, in different ways in different communities. And just, I guess, one more thing to say is that we'll be talking about some of the methods for how you just how you find out about these um, about these eight methods, what's missing, what's what's needed, um, and so we'll kind of refer back to um, how will you find out more about the resources that practitioners need in your CCR. Um, rules and regulations. So this includes the law, domestic violence law, sexual violence law, trafficking law as well as policies and protocols for each agency. And um, what a, a CCR uh, really does is to um, give, allow each member, so each different agency to give input on the other agency's policies and protocols because there's a recognition that every different agency is affected. So for, for example, um, the police are gonna be directly affected by um, the rules and regulations um, that shape the work of emergency operators. You know, what do they do when they get a, an emergency call? And prosecutors are going to be directly affected by the protocols that direct police on what kind of information they're supposed to gather. What are they supposed to do at the scene? When are they supposed to make an arrest? Um, because, you know, prosecutors won't be able to move forward in many cases without um, rules and policies directing police to gather certain information. This is also, you know, having written policies and protocols um, is one way that um, we can um, improve accountability, which is another of the eight methods. But if we don't have these written policies and protocols, there's, uh, we don't have a way to um, direct police on what's the standard practice. Like what are, what are what's the expectation? And not just police, I should say all, you know, workers in all different sorts of agencies. Um, administrative practices are all the paper that's involved in a case. So if you've worked in a government agency before, or even a domestic violence or sexual violence organization, you'll know that there are lots of different forms that get filled out. Um, there are lots of um, other texts that you're working with. Um, and uh, administrative practices is about, uh, this method is about looking at what do those forms say, how are they organized, and um, how do they standardize the work of, of professionals? Because we know that people are busy and they really rely on 
written text to be able to do their jobs and to collect the information that they need to collect. And that often changing a form or discovering what's missing in a form can make a big difference in um, the information that's collected. So we have a good example here. This is um, a risk assessment policy used by the Duluth Police Department. And this is included in the police report that officers have to fill out at every domestic violence call. It's a set of questions to assess um, the risk of violence, um, risk of, of um, the level of risk that a victim is facing. And one important thing about this is that this information doesn't just stay with the police, it's shared. So this form also directs police on how to collect information that's gonna be useful across the system in um, making the violence visible, uh, you know, allowing other agencies to see what's happening to this victim and um, in allowing them to take steps to keep her safe. Another piece, Laura, if you can just keep it there for a second, is another piece about this risk assessment form, which when we developed this, is that we wanted the answers to be a narrative form, that we didn't want it to be a yes or no. That a lot of risk assessment tools have questions like, um, you know, did he ever threaten to kill you or harm you? Yes or no, right? And so what we found often when we used to do it that way, when we said to victims, well, you know, you said yes to that, what did you mean? And he said, well, yeah, he said it, but I didn't really mean it. Well, a whole bunch of those yeses, right, were getting put into that yes. And they were also getting mixed in with a woman who said yes. And he told me, he actually drove me out to the spot in the middle of the woods where he told me he would dig a hole and bury me, right? Well, that's a very different answer of yes than a woman, right, who has said yes, where she he said it, but she didn't feel like he meant it, right? So we're also just sort of very thoughtful about this um, in terms of these and kind of also related to the, the previous one you said, Laura, about the resources, right? Because a big thing about making changes in any organization is that we look at victim safety, offender accountability, but we also, we call this the, the third sort of, you know, um, um, sort of leg of the stool is that we also want to make sure that we're not adding a whole bunch of additional work to practitioners because then they're just not going to do it, right? So we always kind of have that in our thinking. And with this in particular, what the police said is that if you got us those dictation devices, you know, that we mentioned, for example, so that's how we got the police to do the narrative answers, you know, is because they could use the dictation work, they could speak into this little handheld, you know, device instead of typing the answers out. So those, those two relate. Okay, so linkages. So linkages is a very important one. It's because it's how we connect practitioners um, to each other and how institutions are connected to the people whose cases they, they process and kind of thinking about how we share um, information. So the sort of the connection amongst practitioners is really important. As Laura mentioned, how what police collect is really important for all the other practitioners down the line. So that's why when we organized what was in a police report, we didn't just organize it to meet the burden of the law. We said, we asked every single agency, okay, police, what do you need? Uh, or we prosecutors, what do you need from the police from this report? They said, well, we need this. Okay, we're going to include that. Probation, what are you going to need? What would be really helpful? We're going to need this, right? So they included that. The, the batters intervention program, the domestic violence offender program, what do you need? What would be helpful for you if you saw this report? Now, everybody didn't get everything they wanted, right? But everybody got an opportunity to give input into what was in those police reports as an example. And then how are institutions connected to the people whose cases they process? That often there's a huge disconnect where um, a case becomes, you know, enters into the system and the practitioners talk to each other, but very rarely are talking to the victim, right? So we were very thoughtful about, you know, having policies. So for, for example, in a sexual assault case where even if nothing was ongoing or maybe you're waiting for some um, evidence to be processed, that still the, the police investigators were required to check in with the victims a minimum number of times per month just to check in with her. And it was interesting that when they started to do that in Duluth, because what they learned essentially is that victims had a lot of things that sort of come back to their memory, little details that they thought they had told the police that they hadn't. So linkages is to each other and to, to the victims that whose cases they're processing. The next one is accountability. And I have to tell you that of all of these eight methods, that this one is one of the most important. 
And it's also the one that most communities really fail on. So for example, um, I'm just gonna give an example. I'm not gonna name the community, but um, you know, Laura and I are working with a, a community uh, right now. And uh, if you look at all the other eight methods, so for example, they have um, a policy. Now we think the policy needs some work, right? But they have some, they have resources, right? They have plenty um, of officers who are assigned to the case. They are linked to agencies, right? They have a, a risk assessment form, they have the tools. But the other piece of this is that what you don't find is there isn't accountability. So in this community, um, there was a assessment to look at um, how many times did the police make an arrest in a case of domestic violence. Now, they did not do a sample of it. They actually looked at every domestic violence case in this very, very large metropolitan city that they looked at all their data, not just a sample size, and said, how often did the police make an arrest? Well, when you looked at the data for other cities for that size, it was quite low. It was like 21 or was it 22% lower, something like that, right? It was really low compared to other cities where it was 80, 90%, right? The other thing is that when you looked at how often did they, um, did they write a, oh, sorry, no, no the arrest was 11%, sorry. And the, the amount of times that they, they wrote a report that they were even there was like 20%. Sorry, I got those percentages uh, mixed up there. But to, to only write a report that they were only there about, you know, who was there, a summary of the case, that they even showed up was only in like 20% of the cases and 11% of the time they made an arrest, right? These are really low numbers. So the question is, how can that be, right? They have training, they have the policy, they have the resources, they have the forms, but they, what they didn't have is they didn't have accountability. They didn't have accountability to follow the policy, to make sure that they filled out the form, right? That they utilized the resources they had, that this was the major thing they were missing. Um, for example, in the state of Minnesota, um, uh, one of the media agencies, the Star Tribune, looked at all the sexual assault cases in Minnesota as a state we had a really low um, prosecution rate. The num when they looked at you know, a number of these methods, this is the one they saw as well, is that supervisors weren't checking, right, to oversee about cases. Supervisors and prosecution agencies weren't checking. So when we think about accountability, we think about this two ways, which is within the agency, right? So a supervisor to the police officer, so top to bottom in a police agency, but also accountability across agencies. So for example, if an advocate saw a police report, right, and in that police report, that what um, the advocate could very clearly see is that the police officer didn't follow the policy. The question was, how will one agency hold another agency accountable? Who will they call? Will they call the supervisor or the officer? And I remember this conversation very clearly and I was making a case to call the officer. I just said to the supervisor, like, you know, I'm gonna ruin my relationship with the police officer if I don't go to them first and I continually go to you. And they just said, no, that's how it works in our organizations. You go to the supervisor. So we ended up having to agree that if we saw an issue, we'd have to go to the supervisor. So that accountability within and across agencies is really, really critical to a coordinated community response. Education and training, Melissa touched on briefly in the sense that we know we can't just train Roy if he's been to training after training after training and you know still needs some work. We know training isn't enough and we know that a lot of resources are already putting into training. However, it is really important that um, when, when we've looked at all of these eight methods when we've um, done our research and we'll talk about the other steps in that process and we've come up with a new um, intervention that workers be trained on how to use that intervention. So what we're talking about mostly here is, um, you know, making sure that um, first that that police and police and prosecutors and um, emergency operators and everyone involved in the system do understand um, the concepts and theories that that are underpinning their roles and responsibilities, and they understand what's expected of them, including any new interventions that um, that we're asking them to carry out. 
So those are just to go back, maybe Lord, just to that graphic that the eight methods graphic. Um, so those are, we're going to talk about a little bit about the methodologies, but those are the eight methods. So what we would say to you is that, you know, a global rights for women, this is the methodology we use when we work in a community. Um, we're going to, we're working in a number of communities right now, but we're always looking at these eight. Now there's the to be discovered because, you know, there could be another way in which a worker's work is organized. Um, nobody's, you know, um, brought up one yet because usually it's covered under the others, but that's why we have that there. But anytime you're looking at a system, and we would say that you're going to start to see now these eight methods in all institutions, right? You'll go to your, your doctor appointment and, and you'll see all these, right? You'll go to your, your local church maybe and you'll see these. So every institution and every job is really organized around these eight. And we really organize them to see whether safety and accountability are accounted for within how, this, how the worker's job is organized. So now we want to talk with you a little bit about then the methodologies that we use to discover these eight. And so the first one is mapping. So um, mapping is, uh, Lord, you wanna, yeah, this one right here. So this is an example of what mapping looks like. And this is from the Rachel case, right? So a lot of times when we'll do uh, work on coordinated community response in a community, we'll actually literally map out the system, right? It's pretty rare, rare that we would be assessing multiple systems because that's just too much work in a period of time. So usually we get asked to to look at one of the systems. So, you know, um, right now we're doing um, police in one community, we're doing an advocacy in another, or actually one of the countries, we are doing a little bit of all of them, every system, because um, in that uh, country we're doing health, um, police, justice, and social services, so we're doing four. But what we do is we map out those systems to look at how cases are processed. Because often what we find is that there's a gap in one of those processes. It doesn't mean that every step is problematic, but often we'll find that there's one step in the process that really is problematic or there needs to be ma major changes. So we'll literally work on drawing a map and sometimes we'll make a change. So for example, in one country we worked in in Eastern Europe, um, it was kind of when they were doing their risk assessment, it was the time in the process that we made a major change about when they did it and then who they shared the information with. So that's an example of mapping. The next is text analysis. Now I know this is a little bit small, but we wanted just to show you, um, and when you get a, the copy of this PowerPoint is, um, is loaded um, uh, up until this session. And most importantly, we wanted to, you to see sort of that top line there. So when we do text analysis, what we do is that, um, just this is an example of the police, is that we will go to a community and we will, this one had 50 police reports. So we got 50 random police reports related. Um, oh, and actually this one is related to high risk offenders. So in this uh, text analysis, we said, give us every police report for the top 10 worst domestic violence offenders in your community. And that's what they gave us. So this text analysis is one of one domestic violence offender. We, I only pulled up a screenshot of six of the police files that were there. But the big thing to look at in particular is what's on that top line there. So Laura, I don't know if you can we make it a little bigger on here. I don't know if we can or if people have to do that on their own screen, but. I think you may have to um, zoom in on your own screen. Okay, okay, I can see it, so that's okay. Um, so the thing is, is that the most important thing to look at is what's on the top, because that's what we decided to look for and this community and in their text announced of their police reports, right? So we wanted to look at the summary of the crime or violence, the summary of injuries, any identifiable risk factors. We wanted to know was there documented risk analysis? Did the police officer do the risk analysis? You can see in this case and those six that I pulled, it wasn't um, done. Want to see was physical evidence collected? Were there witnesses? Um, was the was the offender gone on arrival? That's what GOA stands for. Um, what were the charges um, and what were some of the notes um, that were there? So this would be an example is that we'll go into a community, we'll, we'll get say 50 police reports and we'll do a text analysis. Uh, in fact, Laura today got um, a new batch of reports for us for, for a community and that one we're doing a lot. Like is 150, Laura? Yeah. 
yeah, we're, we're going to do, Laura and I together, we're, we'll do a text analysis of 150 police reports, right? So we'll divide those up amongst us. But what we did with the coordinated community response and the other partners in this community is we all decided together what was going to be on that top line, right? Like, what were we going to be looking for? What was our eyes, what were our eyes going to be looking for? And Laura, do you want to share any other, what were some examples of things that we decided on that one that aren't here? Is there anything? Sure. I think well, when so for protection by Violations, I think. Yeah, order for protection violations was an issue that was identified. Um, response time was a big issue. Oh, yeah. um, how long it takes police to respond to an emergency call. Um, demographics, we want to know yeah. if there's a difference in police response um, based on the victims and offenders races. Um, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of issues in this in this particular um, community. There's a lot of issues they want to look at, um, and we were lucky to have folks from you know from across the system. So the prosecutor gave some really good input on what he wanted to see. The advocates in the group, you know, had things they wanted to look at. So there'll be a pretty comprehensive one. Yeah, and in a little bit, what guided us as well was some preliminary information from victims that. A lot of um, black women in this community in particular were saying that they weren't calling the police, for example, because they were concerned about how the police would, um, you know, um, treat the offender um, who was also um, black or indigenous or a person of color. So um, that that's why we included that category. So really, we, we decide together which of these categories will be listed here on the top. So yeah, it's text analysis. Um, am I, sorry, Laura, am I doing this one? Sorry, I didn't think. I think so, yeah. Okay, all right, yes. Yeah. So the importance of victim input. Oh, yeah, so this is, um, and then you're gonna talk about the focus group specifics, but a little bit about the importance of the um, victim input. Really often what we find is that, um, is a lot of communities will say, oh, well, we have advocates on our coordinated community response. They, they know what victims think. They can just provide that voice, right? Um, or that we have people on this coordinated community response who've been victims before. You know, they, they bring that voice forward. The problem with that is that the victim's voices really need to be at the center. And also, we want to know how victims experience violence, violence currently. And what um, and how current practices result in gaps what victims need from the system. So for example, when I started out as an advocate, when I started getting paid, I was a volunteer before then, but I started getting paid as an advocate in 1999, right? At that point, I don't know, was there social media? I don't remember if, if, if there was, it just started, you know, like, so um, that wasn't a thing, right? Where people would use social media to, to stalk you know, people, for example, um, you know, there wasn't um, a pandemic, right? So in part, we have to always continually be doing focus groups and interviews with victims because we have to understand how the current system, right? Because I was an advocate, right, from 1999 to um, 2016, right? Now, that was a long time, 17 years. I have a lot of experience from that. However, what victims are experiencing now, five years later, I'm sure is very different than my last year when I did a lot of direct advocacy, right? So yes, I have experience I bring to the table, but that, that can never replace what victims are experiencing now and today. So that's why we say it's really important to continually include victims' voices. So um, another thing that we often find is that a lot of communities say, well, we'll just do some data or we'll do a prevalence survey that um, we're working in a country right now and helping them um, do their prevalence survey. They're going to be you know, figuring, doing a random sample of the number of victims of domestic and sexual violence. Um, the, the problem with this that is that um, those tools are useful for finding out the prevalence and the demographics, but surveys cannot provide a full understanding of a women's lived experience, and they do not provide the information about the gaps that are experienced and how a system provides it. So, for example, you can ask a woman in a prevalence survey, who did you seek for help, right? And she may tell you. 
Well, the ones that she didn't check off, right? We don't get to find out why she didn't go to those people, right? And even if we do in a prevalence survey, often it's very, very limited information, right? Because if that's our focus is to understand why there's been, you know, a decrease in the number of women who are calling the police or getting help from the advocates community, we want to really find out in depth about the why. And data collection prevalence surveys will, are, are helpful, but never just provide us enough in that regard. So we just, um, Paulo Freire is, um, is a Brazilian educator. Um, he really inspires a lot. He's passed away now, but really inspires a lot of the work um, that we do. If you want to read a very, very dense book, but extraordinarily helpful is Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And, and this quote says, many political and educational plans have failed because, they're, because their authors designed them according to their own personal views of reality, never once taking into the account the people in a situation to whom their program was obstinately directed. Meaning that, you know, we can sort of come and say, we seek to create a program for this group of people and then not include those groups of people in the design of it. That really, if we want to do really good programming and close the gaps between what institutions provide and what victims need, we want that to be closed. We have to include victims' voices in the design of whatever we're creating. So how do we do that? We do that through focus groups and individual interviews. And um, what this means is gathering together a group of victims in a particular community who have experienced violence. And we might look for um, specific experiences that, that these women have had. For example, um, we might look for women in our you know, current work in the community where we're working on the police response. We might look for victims who have called the police during a particular time period. Um, but our goal is to really hear from victims about their lived experiences of violence and their attempts to access help from the system and what that was like. So, um, you know, um, what barriers did they meet? Um, what were also what were their positive experiences if there were any and um, what would have changed the experience or improved the experience for them? Um, and this is in a focus group, it's, it's also about having a conversation so um, victims can listen to each other, often share similar experiences. Um, we've been doing some individual interviews this year because of COVID, so having to do interviews remotely and that works too and some, some people prefer to have an individual interview because it feels more private, whereas others prefer to be able to listen to other other people's experiences that may be um, similar or different from their own. Um, but what we find is that, um, you know, that victims, um, when they share their experiences, they really start to expose the sources of, of the problems, which can then lead us to start thinking about, you know, um, understanding that, that source of the problem more. Um, we may have an idea, for example, um, from advocates or from our review of text analysis that, wow, the police are really taking a long time to respond to a particular, or when they, when they go to a domestic or sexual violence call, but we'll learn more from victims about what that's like and how that impacts them um, and be able to really think about how are we gonna solve this problem. Do you wanna, well, and I actually will pull up, um, I'm gonna pull up a, a document to share with you while Melissa adds anything that you want to add to that. Yeah, so one thing is, is that um, Laura's um, pulling up this document. Well, one of the challenges often of doing focus groups and then sharing with the CCR is often what they say is not good about the system. And we have to be able to accept that. You know, I've been in a lot of communities where they'll say things like, well, you know, that was probably done before we changed our policy. Well, regardless of when it was now, I, I remember when that question got brought up, it actually wasn't. It was after they had implemented their new domestic assault policy is when the, this um, feedback came in from this particular um, community. Because when we showed this community this feedback, that was the first thing the head of the agency said, well, I, I think this is from women who experienced you know, uh, with our agency at this time. And we looked you know, just to see, because we were sort of curious um, and it wasn't so. So this is a summary of a report that we create after um, we've done focus groups. And this is an excerpt of a report that we did um, after working in a country in Europe. 
And it just, uh, it's something that we would share with the CCR, um, perhaps later with other decision makers, but it, uh, what it does is um, we explain what the purpose of the focus group was, the design, um, a little bit about the participants, no identifying information, but some information about um, where they live, their, their demographics, um, the type of data collected and any specific questions that we asked. And then, um, and then this part is um, where we try to, we, after we go over our notes from the focus group or listen to the recording that we've made, we identify any themes that, that came up. So what are some issues that came up that a lot of uh, participants in the focus group identified? In this particular um, focus group, a lot of women talked about police being really unresponsive when they tried to get help and even creating obstacles. So, you know, asking them to change their story so that they didn't have to make an arrest or, um, you know, placing extra burdens on the victim to file a complaint, things like that. So um, you'll see here some quotes that were pulled from the focus group, not with any identifying information, but just to sort of illustrate um, how these themes played out. So this is a report that um, that we would share with the CCR, and it's a way of develop, you know, kind of sharing this understanding of what's uh, what's been gained from the focus group, and then starting to to go into kind of the next step of analysis. So I'm going to share the um, PowerPoint again. Yeah, and, and one thing just to know, you know, that's just an example of one. No, not all focus groups are like that, you know, but sometimes they are, and we wanted to show you a kind of a harder one where victims had some really just, you know, you read that report and it's like pretty consistent, a pretty poor response, you know, by that police agency, um, you know, and th those can be some of the more challenging ones to, to, to share. So, okay, so these are examples when we think about coordinated community responses and what they develop. So we wanted just to share some examples. You know, coordinated community responses are really responsible for creating interventions, right? Things that advance the work to ending um, violence against women. So one of the things is that the first um, mandatory arrest policy um, happened in Duluth, Minnesota, um, and then they, um, ended up creating a predominant aggressor policy and risk assessment. But the first risk assessment came out of Duluth in 1994. And that, that's how they kind of decided where they want to delineate amongst the cases. So that's an example that got created out of processing a lot of cases and wanting to figure out who's most dangerous to whom, right? And, and what, what can we do to address those sorts of cases? Um, sexual assault nurse examiners, um, they, they really came out of coordinated community responses, deciding as a community about having specialized nurses in sexual assault cases. They were de developed through that process through victims, through victims having a voice saying, when I go to a hospital, I really want somebody who's specialized in this, somebody who really cares about this issue. So that's how sexual assault nurse examiners really came about to be. Um, a CCR um, response to women's use of violence. Um, I'll never forget. So the, the very first um, time when, when Duluth put in its mandatory arrest policy um, back many, many years ago, it was a lot of work to get the Duluth police chief to agree to have this policy in place. So Ellen Pence, who is my mentor, she's passed away um, a while ago, but when, when she, she always told this story of how she got the police chief to agree to take this policy and have one of the shifts do this policy and one not. So the, the police chief agreed to have the night shift do the mandatory arrest policy and the day shift not do it for a period of time. And then they switched where they had the night policy, the night um, shift not do the mandatory arrest policy, but have the day shift. So do it kind of like a pilot project. Um, in part because she wanted to kind of prove to the police chief that this was the better response. And that's really what got him to shift to see why this was important. But I remember the very first night that the mandatory arrest policy was put in place, um, a bunch of, a group of people in Duluth were together kind of, we got to go to the, the 911 communication center, kind of listen in, um, kind of waiting for the first call to come in that night, you know, for domestic violence. Um, uh, you know, it kind of sounds sad. We're all kind of waiting for a domestic violence call to happen, but we knew, you know, eventually, usually there's one every night, and and certainly there was. 
But you know, what happened was is when that very first call came in in Duluth for the mandatory rest policy, it was a call of where a woman used violence towards a man. And I remember everyone kind of thinking, oh, darn it, right? Like we didn't, that's not the kind of case we were thinking about for this policy, right? This mandatory rest. We were thinking about when a man uses violence to our women and you know, that it's overwhelmingly, he's the abuser. Now this was clearly a case where a woman was fighting back, right? But then it made a shift to think, okay, when we have a lot of women who are fighting back, right? And responding to abusers who are using that oppressive violence towards them and they're resisting it, what will our community response be to that? Because we don't wanna really sort of think of those and treat those cases as the same because they're not. So really we created a, a, a completely different um, response for those cases. Um, and then we also um, worked very hard when I was in Duluth about the probation policy for unannounced visits and monitoring cases in domestic violence. This is an example of how, so the coordinated community response created this initiative where we were going to do unannounced visits and monitoring of cases where probation officers would randomly stop by the probationer's house and do a check. The thing, though, that we hadn't done yet, which we did before we did these, is we did a focus group with battered women to say, okay, if probation's going to do an unannounced visit, right, to the probationer's home, what should all the things we be thinking about? And what if you're there, right? What are all the things we should have in our minds? And one of the things that all the battered women very clearly said is that if you come and do an unannounced visit and I'm there, it's very important that you don't talk to me, right? I, I, I can't even have you acknowledge me because the moment you acknowledge me, he will think that you and I are like, you know, cooperating against him. And then I'll have to pay for that after you leave. Well, that was something that we had never even discussed when we were talking about this. So it's a really good example of why doing focus groups on a regular basis with victims is really important. And then the last thing that got created was the power and control wheel. So I know a lot of people are familiar with what the power and control wheel is, but for those of you that don't know, the power and control wheel was created because um, in Duluth, we were using what's known as the cycle of violence that was created by Lenore Walker, which is that the, there's a tension building phase and then there's the violent incident phase and then there's the honeymoon phase. I know that some people still use this um, theory and graphic, but we're really going to encourage you not to. And the reason why is because too many women have said, I have never experienced a honeymoon phase, that I don't know what you're talking about. And in Duluth, what was happening is we were using this, um, that the Lenore Walker cycle of violence, it was developed in the late 1970s. And so, but victims kept saying, I don't have that honeymoon phase. So what happened in Duluth is that the, the founders of Duluth stopped using the cycle of violence theory and just said to victims, okay, we're just gonna listen. All we're gonna do is we want you to come to these support groups, tell us what you experienced and we're gonna document it. So they did this for, for actually almost a year. And what happened from that then was created the power and control wheel. And that what you see is inside of those spokes and all those tactics, those are all the tactics, the most common tactics that women said that they experienced. Now, this what's inside of the power control wheel in those spokes, so like using intimidation, emotional abuse, those were not um, those were not things that were you know the only things, right? These were the things that were most common. So when a lot of people sort of say this thing about you know we're now using the word coercive control, but all those sort of a lot of those tactics in there really are coercive controlling, and and are what victims said. And then the physical and sexual violence, right, is what all of them were experiencing. So for example, you can never take any of those tactics outside of that outside ring of physical and sexual violence. So for example, a lot of people will look at the power and control wheel and say, well, my partner uses emotional abuse, you know, are, are, are they an abuser? We would say, well, the question is not about if they just use emotional abuse, but have they used or caused fear of physical or sexual violence and use emotional abuse as another tactic of intimidation? Because when abusers use physical and sexual violence and those tactics, what they end up with is power and control. And that's why power and control is in the middle of that wheel. And so just a little bit of history of that, this got created um, as part of the CCR because we were using sort of this theory, this, this cycle of violence theory that, that lots of women just um, couldn't relate to.
So I think that brings us to the end of the material that we have prepared. So we have some time for questions um, or comments. And like Melissa said, I am pretty sure that if you raise your hand, we can um, turn on your mic or you can ask any questions in the chat or make any comments. Um, Yeah, so we're a little bit curious, is this information new for you? Is this things you've heard before? You know, kind of what stood out? We can just wait for a minute to see if there's questions. We've provided our contact information um, on this page here, our email addresses and some helpful websites for you. The one for us at Global Rights for Women and then domestic interview abuse intervention programs and domestic violence turning points. We'll just wait to see if anybody's typing. We kind of purposely left about 20 minutes um, at the end, just in case there were comments and questions. We know that we'd much rather be in New York uh, doing this and not doing this, you know, this way. Um, it was just a year ago, you know, that or just, you know, over a year ago that we were in New York and or that this guy canceled. So hopefully next year we will be able to see you all uh, in person in New York. Is there any other comments or, or, or questions? We most certainly don't have to stand to the end of the time. We just like to leave an opportunity, you know, for people. And we'd something. love to hear any examples you have too, if you are working as part of a coordinated community response or um, if anything, you know, resonated with you that you're interested in, you know, just discussing more. Or if you've done focus groups or, or interviews with victims, or if you're a person who works for an agency that does similar work to us, if you include this as part of your strategy, um, we'd like to hear about that. Now we won't call in one, anyone because we know that's a little bit harder, you know, in this sort of format. So we won't do that, but we'll just give just a couple more minutes um, to see if anybody has anything else for the chat. Um, Otherwise, we, we will, um, in this session, we won't just sit in here and just smile, you know. <laughs> Lauren, do you want to put maybe just a slide of the eight methods back up? Sure. We're just also a little bit curious if like this concept of the eight methods is new to you, if this is something you've seen before. Um, as a strategy. If you could tell us that in the chat, we'd appreciate it. I think everyone might be um, sleepy. It's that yeah. late afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also we're all getting a little bit of Zoom fatigue also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see a comment here. One thing that you noted toward the end is that women noted not having a honeymoon phase. Are there other common misconceptions about abuse that are pervasive and should be challenged? Yeah, um, I would say that, um, you know, in um, the honeymoon phase is definitely a big one. I think the other one is that there's this, um, there's a lot of people that put forth this notion of like, um, I am not a, just to show you my best, I'm not a big promoter of, you know, like self-defense classes, you know, um, uh, and women's empowerment as a, as a strategy to end violence against women. Now, I'm not saying that those things can't contribute to it, but I do think it's a real problem when we say that because too often what we see is that people talk so much about victim safety and not enough about um, offender accountability. So uh, we've worked in, Laura and I worked with, a, we did this CCR training with a, a um, a country we'll just see in the Pacific region of the world. 
And when we're so interesting for Laura and I to talk to them because so many of their strategies were about victim safety, right? They put so many services around them. They had, they had housing for them. They had all these things, right? But what they didn't have is they didn't have much offender accountability, right? So they did very little to arrest offenders. I mean, it was like rare that an offender got arrested, um, but they put all this stuff on victims of all the things that they should do. And, and so I would say that generally there's this imbalance that we see sort of a lot for sure. And also things that where I hear people talk about to victims, um, we have this video that Lauren, in fact, we showed this in particular video yesterday. And every time we show this video, um, so it's, it's a woman who is just really, you know, I don't like this word, but I'm just gonna use it. It's kind of like nagging at her partner to do something, okay? Now, I hate that word, that nag word, but you know, the video is created in that way to show that. And he ends up using, you know, he ends up like strangling her with one hand, throwing her on the couch and throwing something in her face. And a lot of, in this training was like so many other trainings when we show this video where people say, well, you know, they, they really have a communication problem. You know, she really needs to work on a communication. Here's the thing, right? Like we cannot take these strategies for couples where there is not this sort of fear, you know, where there's not sort of one person using dominance to control the other. Um, you know, this sort of relationship is not the same as this, right? Where there's, there's not that sort of imbalance of power. And too often we see people put for strategies, right? Where it's like, you know, like my husband and I could probably, you know, use some communication skills, right? But I'm not scared of him. He's not scared of me. There's no dominance, right? So we can take those strategies for those relations and try and put them, they're not gonna be effective. It doesn't matter if she asks him nicely or whether she nags at him to clean up his mess. Either way, it's not a justification for him to use violence towards her and strangle her. So we'll also often see that quite a bit. Yeah, right, Melissa. Um, Gabriella makes a similar comment in the chat about how many systems still treat domestic violence as a communications issue or a relationship issue. And we definitely hear that a lot, um, mm -hmm. as Melissa was saying. Um, but we also know that there, you know, many survivors do so many things to try to improve their relationship, right? They, they do, they, they, um, because they're told often that it's a relationship issue, they try to solve it that way. And it can actually be very dangerous for them to, you know, go to a, a couple's therapist when they don't feel safe, um, um, saying what's actually happening, um, or, um, where what they might, what they say, you know, they never know if what they say in the counseling session is going to end up, um, you know, cause leading to harm to them later. So that's yeah. a really good point. Um, yeah, there's another question here. Do you have advice for people who are not as involved in this work about supporting, recognizing survivors of violence in our own lives? Yeah, just one other thing quick, Laura, I just want to also um, respond to Gabriella. And I don't know, Gabriella, if you're in the US or not, but I'm just putting here in the chat, um, Pathways to Family Peace is our batters intervention program that we do do over Zoom. And we started that even before COVID. And we do take um, referrals from all over the United States for men to be in the program. So if you happen to be in the US, we do not take referrals outside of the US. Um, but then to go to Marissa's question. So yeah, um, Laura, I know if you want to talk about this a little bit because you're, um, you know. Sure, yeah, you know, I've worked on this issue professionally for a while now, um, but also I've had friends who have been survivors and it's a really different experience even for, you know, even having um, done this work. So um, I think some of the most helpful things are to first to just believe, um, believe the survivor, show that you um, support her, reiterate um, that nothing justifies the violence, you know, they, that there's a, I think that um, as sort of a survival mechanism, um, survivors tend to blame themselves or, or believe, believe the blame that's put on them, because it's sort of a way of thinking maybe things are okay, kind of, you know, uh, maybe I can manage this problem if it's my fault. Um, but I think just reiterating that it's not her fault, that she doesn't deserve the violence, and then trying to be someone who um, helps to connect her to resources or even just pick up kind of the, um, the, the really difficult things that come up. Like, um, for example, when I had a friend who was leaving her partner, she um, needed to open a bank account without him knowing. And so our friends got together and 
and helped her do that and contributed some money, some temporary money for her to have in that bank account. So just, you know, there's practical finding out what the person needs, you know, um, whether or not they're leaving, you know, what do they, what, what do they need and what can they rely on you for? And um, how can you connect them to people um, like advocates, domestic violence advocates or sexual violence advocates who, um, who really are just like this great source of support and kind of gateway to other uh, resources also. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I would just say about that is that, um, is that is just is patience, right? Is that in the end, survivors always need us to be there and not to be judgmental. Now, I will say that we should also be asking victims critical questions that too often we find that people have this notion of supporting victims is not questioning any decision they're making. We should still question, right? And ask critical thinking questions, but not do it um, with judgment. Yeah. Um, so there is another comment here um, about um, about the self-defense and Lucia. Yeah, I want to say that, uh, or Lucia, uh, that I'm not saying that these things aren't helpful. I'm just saying that too often we see that, you know, people want to do women's empowerment, self-empowerment for women, self-defense, and, and that only, and not on the other side, work on, you know, the things of, um, you know, um, accountability. Um, so yeah, so, and, you know, I'm also familiar with the self-defense piece of like sort of training the muscles and training the brain, um, you know, and those sort of strategies. We just want to make sure that it's not too imbalanced, right? That, that we can't be creating a whole bunch of women who have self-defense tactics because we keep having so many men who commit violence against women, right? So that becomes our only response, that we have to have a response. And the other part I would say is that we're not just talking about a criminal justice response. We're also talking about a community response. Um, I remember, you know, this story about um, my, my friend Ellen, her sister had, her sister Mary had experienced, uh, and I'm telling you a story that's been told publicly, it's not private, but her sister Mary had experienced a lot of um, violence against Bob and her and Bob had divorced. And Ellen, um, we're at Ellen's house for Thanksgiving, this huge family dinner. And, um, and um, Bob was going to be coming to pick up the son from this Thanksgiving over to his Thanksgiving. So Bob comes in all dressed up, you know, and, and everybody knows that Bob had just, you know, really severely beat up Mary two weeks ago, right? Um, it was quite a violent incident. She, you know, was still recovering from that even physically. And so he had already gotten a new girlfriend and um, Bob comes and picks up the son and kind of acts like nothing happens, right? And it was only Mary who had the guts to say, hey, Bob, are you beating up your new girlfriend yet? Right. And everybody was just sort of shocked. Right. But it's this whole thing of which that in our communities and our families, so many people are silent. Right. Where Mary, who's the one who suffered the violence at the hands of Bob, is the one who had the guts to speak up. Right. Where everybody else, Mary's sister and family and friends stayed quiet. Right. No, I'm not saying that everybody should, you know, say that to Bob as he walks in. But the problem is, is that when guys like Bob don't get messages of accountability wherever they go, they live in a community with impunity, right? So if you think about your community and you think about, you know, the community that you live in, it's likely that an act of violence against women happened last night in your community, right? So this morning, when that abuser woke up, if, if the police weren't called last night, did that abuser wake up this morning and think, huh, if the police get called, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble, right? There's going to be a response and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. Or does he wake up thinking, is the coffee hot? What's for breakfast, right? And thinking his life isn't going to change. And the problem is, is that too many abusers wake up in a community where not much has changed in their lives, right? So the other thing is that we don't just rely on systems, right, to create accountability, that abusers and offenders have to live in a, a world in which wherever they go, there's some response or there's no motivation, right, to end this behavior or change it. Any other thoughts or comments from anyone? Just looking here. Oh, I see that Gabrielle also said that the eight methods is new. 
Yeah, it really is. We've just found it to be extraordinarily helpful um, in terms of changing a systemic response. I mean, I remember a couple of times we just changed a form, right, of something uh, and changing a form and what that form asked the practitioner to fill out really made a big difference in terms of what everyone was experiencing in terms of how the cases were processed differently. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, talk a little bit about how different cases are processed briefly. Uh, Gabriel, do you mean different cases in terms of like different levels, meaning low risk, medium risk, high risk, risk? Or are you talking about domestic violence versus sexual assault? Is that, is that what you mean? I was trying to get a lot. Yeah, I was talking. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that we have um, decided and sort of thought about, um, so one of the tricks about, you know, the different levels of cases, so yes, low, medium, high risk. Um, the challenge about this is that low risk cases often get minimized too much, right? So those women may not be experiencing a lot of physical violence, strangulation, strangulation and such, but they're living quite awful lives, right? But at the same time, there are some indicators. So for example, gone on arrival cases, right? And call those GOA, stands for gone on arrival. One thing we know is that when offenders are gone on arrival, when the police come, it is one of the indicators, right? That gives us that he is of high risk to commit further domestic violence. So what we've done, so for example, in those cases is developed a policy that says, you know, um, Lori, we, we can talk a little bit about like, you know, the one community we're working in, right? Like they have a policy that says, you know, you that police actually have to document what have they done, right? To make efforts towards, you know, going to look for the suspect because what happens so often on those gone on arrival cases is then the police didn't do anything, right? And then often he'd either go severely hurt or kill her, right? And so that was one of the indicators. So in part, what we're trying to do is take that data and that information and learn from it, um, from victims um, in that regard. Um, we also, just in terms of how we process cases, like in Duluth, we have um, the divert team. So the divert team meets um, every other Wednesday morning to look through cases together as a team, but every morning an advocate looks at cases. So part of it that's helpful about that, so we've created this process where an advocate just goes into the police agency in the morning, but with an advocate's eye to a police agency and you see that the same offender maybe is doing things, it allows us, right, to communicate to the rest of the system, this is a really problematic situation. We have to look out for this. So then we're able to put forth the resources of the rest of the system to respond um, to those cases. So that's really important. And then the other thing that we've done is we haven't really talked about much is use expert witnesses. So I've testified in a lot of um, criminal cases as an expert witness. So those cases where, you know, victims are simply just too scared to come forth and testify, or if they do, they say very little. Um, I'll go into those communities. It's been easy. This one thing that's been easier with COVID is I can testify in a lot more cases across um, the U.S. as an expert witness. Um, because victims are so terribly scared of, um, about their offender. So, Laura, do you want to add anything about that? No. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. I was just thinking about if I forgot anything about that gone on arrival, that policy and the I mean, I just say that one thing is one thing the advocates pointed out, right? That yeah. when we when we were looking at in this community where we're going to be doing a text analysis very soon, it was one of the first things the advocates said that they wanted to make sure that was on sort of that the top of that spreadsheet that we looked for was yeah. gone on arrival cases. Yeah, and it, I think it did highlight a difference in how police were seeing the cases as to as opposed to advocates because they were seeing it, and it, it kind of goes back to the theory of what causes the violence, as you brought up, Gabriella, they were seeing it as, well, he left the house, the dispute is over. So now, you know, she's safe. And yeah. I think the advocates understand, no, this is a guy who understands that he's going to escape accountability by leaving the house, you know, so he's mm -hmm. actually pretty sophisticated in his understanding of how the system works and, um, and what he needs to do to avoid accountability. Um, and that that can be really dangerous because then he's gonna, you know, come back and 
um, potentially hurt her again. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think we're at the end of our time. So Laura, maybe you wanna put the last slide, but you're welcome to email us. Um, we've been doing this process now for quite a while and doing it in uh, communities in our, in our home, um, you know, home state um, and across the world. Um, currently, you know, we're working on projects in um, Australia, Haiti, the Bahamas, uh, Eastern Europe and in our home state. So we look forward to connecting with you all. Feel free to send us an email, connect with us this way. Um, we, we'd really enjoy getting to know of you and, and know of how we can be of help. But thank you for your time and your attention and hope next year we can see you all in person. Yeah, enjoy the rest of CSW and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.